Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, wherever you may be, whenever you may be watching this. This is Unit 5, Styles, Introduction to Film Appreciation with Mr. Henley. Let's get into it. So we're going to start with the Hollywood style, which of course most of us are kind of familiar with. In fact, it's one of those things where if you're like me, you, you, it's kind of like saying like an American accent. How do you define an American accent? I know what a British accent sounds like. I know what an Australian accent sounds like, but I don't know if I really know what an American accent sounds like, because to me, that's what most people around us sound like. Granted, there are certain sub accents within America, Boston, New York, you know, up north, southern, etc. But, you know, it's the same way. And Hollywood style is kind of like that. It's like the generic thing that we're so familiar with because as we have told stories over the decades, as Hollywood has grown up, we have come up with certain conventions that just seem to work for showing movies. One classic example of Hollywood style is the establishing shot, aka the classic sequence. And you can see this with the Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. Uh, this is a classic scene. It's usually very big and epic. You often see them used in trailers. And here we see Gandalf riding on Shadowfax in Return of the King. He's headed to the city of Gondor. And as he rides up, the camera pans out. Gandalf and Shadowfax get smaller. The city, which is huge, humongous. I think it's like nine tiers or something to that city, if I remember correctly, starts to be shown in, in its immensity um, and its grandeur. And so you really kind of start to get a scale. And even still, Gandalf is still far away from it to really truly show the scale of the city. A lot of the reason why Hollywood style is so successful is because, well, it's successful. It makes money. And what does Hollywood exist for? It exists to make money. Everybody wants to make money. Everybody wants to get paid. There are a few directors and filmmakers that don't really care about that. But ultimately, if they don't make things to get paid, they can't get make those things that they don't care about getting paid for. So typically, Hollywood is going to imitate, imitate things as well. This is why you see movies like Harry Potter. For six movies, it made tons of money. So by the time they got to that seventh movie, they said, you know, we're fixing to get out of our cash cow. What do we do? Let's split it into two parts. This is also why Hunger Games got split into two parts when it got to the final movie. This is part of the reason why The Hobbit, when it came out as a movie after the success of The Lord of the Rings, they split the one book into three. The Twilight Saga, the final book, was two parts instead of just one. Hollywood recognizes these formulas and people want to see these movies. People don't want to see the story rushed. They're willing to come back and pay a second movie ticket to see the other part of the story. And so Hollywood does this because it makes money. Movies that are boring, movies that don't make any money, Hollywood puts them to the side. In fact, they probably put them under a lens and like, what was wrong with this movie? Why did this movie not do well? We don't want to do that again. And they analyze it and try to figure it out so they can fix it for future success. A lot of film critics tend to say that the classic Hollywood style was so successful because it's quote unquote invisible. Like I said, it's kind of difficult to tell for me, what an American accent sounds like. I guess if I hear it against others, I can kind of sort of start to tell. Sometimes you see these videos on YouTube of people doing accents. But it's, it is kind of invisible to those of us that see it. And the same thing goes with Hollywood. The editing is intended to be invisible because the story, most of the editing in Hollywood is about the story, not about the creativity of the editor working with the director. Um, so not entirely invisible, but as Hollywood developed a style, the audience learned to accept it and read it. It's almost like a language. Um, I don't have this on here, but you think about like a television show. When I was growing up in the 80s, we used to watch a lot of shows that started with this was filmed in front of a live studio audience. And then you would hear the laughter during certain punchlines and moments of jovality mispronouncing the word there um in these shows where they would you know they would say a punchline and the audience would laugh and sometimes you listen to that and you watch it and it's kind of jarring it's like who's laughing why are these people off camera laughing but at the same time it also kind of elicits the response to you say oh that was funny i should be laughing as well because you know it kind of gives you that movie experience but at home on the television and that's kind of what we start to see with this a little bit. You know, we understand what canned laughter is. Sometimes it's a live studio audience. Sometimes it's just a laugh track that's added after the fact. But we start to understand that with the camera pans, it's not 
freaking or, or creepy or crazy to us. When we cross cut between two se um, scenes, they may not be happening in the same place, but we know they're happening at the same time. Or there's something between the two of them that we need to be aware of. You know, this this sequence affects that sequence, even if they're not exactly minute for minute, second for second. Zoom in the camera in from a far away for a close-up shot. You know, and you have to remember, a lot of Hollywood movies came after the, the, the acting was done with plays, and in a play, you had a stage, and you didn't just close off part of the stage and open up the stage, and you could do this a little bit with backdrops, but for the most part, the stage was always there. The audience could direct their attention where they wanted to, but now with film, we're, we've got a camera telling the audience, this is where we want you to look. This is where we need you to look. This is where you need to pay attention, and, and that's a little bit different than what we're accustomed to um, as an audience. So why the close-up? Why the close-up in general? Close-ups were put into movies for two reasons. So remember, a lot of early films would always show the entire person. It was believed to be you couldn't cut off a person at the knees, you couldn't cut off a person at the waist, you had to show the whole person. And this is because in a play, you could see the entire person. Even if they were behind a table, you knew the whole person was there. So close-ups were put in movies was a big thing. It was a big thing at the time. Today, we don't think anything of it. But to, back in the 1910s, the 1920s, even the 1890s and such, to see a close-up of an actor was kind of crazy. Now, the story we saw in film sometimes demanded for a character to be isolated. We don't, we don't want the character to be in retrospect to the others. We kind of want to focus in on this one person. Like, what are they thinking? What are they feeling? And so this allows for, and also it allows for actors to really show up and show inner emotion, fear, joy, confidence, anger, affection, disgust. I don't know, I'm starting to get movie vibes here. Like, like there's certain inner emotions that they're trying to show us here. I don't know. Anyway, so remember a famous story or myth perhaps, this was, you know, kind of anecdotal or whatever, says that the first time a close-up was used in the movies, a person in the audience jumped up and said, show us his feet, when the camera was doing a close-up, because the camera, show, the, you know, the close-up would show, like, maybe the chest, kind of what you see of me right now on this film, uh, Citizen Kane, and this image here, this is a close-up, whereas most believe before that, especially in music, now musicals, you're going to see usually the feet as well, because they're dancing, and you want to be able to see what they're doing. So this was often done. People were very freaked out if it was not shown in this way. Because remember, back then, people watched plays. And in a play, you saw the entire person. You didn't see just the top of the person. You didn't see just the bottom of the person, which is kind of weird when you think about like little finger puppets. But, you know, you kind of understand that, what's going on there. So anyway, perhaps the answer audience was ready for close-up shots. It didn't seem natural at the time to people and all that. Um, I'm actually going to read something here. So it says, Media guru Marshall McLuhan wrote about um, African countries, where in Africa they would go to these people who had never seen a movie before. This was brand new technology to them. And they would be shown educational movies that came from the United Nations. And the educational movies were trying to teach them how to be healthy. In this particular case, a lot of the films were trying to show these African native um, people how to get rid of standing water because standing water bred mosquitoes, caused malaria, you know, because mosquitoes transmit malaria. You don't want standing water sitting around. You need to get rid, you know, standing water breeds disease. And so they were trying to get these people to do it. But in the movies, in these films, these educational films they showed to these native Africans, the people would sometimes just walk off screen, which to most of us is not a big deal, but the people would freak out when this happened because the person disappeared. They no longer saw this person. Where did the person go? Was the person abducted? Was some did God come and take them down? What what happened to these people? Or maybe some something bad had happened to them, and the people would freak out. They had not been exposed to filmmaking techniques. This unspoken language, if you would, that people understood by watching movies. Walking off screen happens all the time in movies and sitcoms and things like that. Most of us have grown up watching this. We don't think anything of it. But if you had not, 
that convention is very unusual. Well, they were on the box, now they're not on the box. Where did they go? Um, so when they shown a film that was cut from extreme long shot of a house, looked very small to a long shot, they would gasp. And they thought the house had magically really grown in size as well. They were like, how'd the house get so big? So these were all things that were just crazy for these people at this time that to nowadays we don't really think very much of. And um, you think about this, if you go back to like the very early stuff we talked about in Unit 1, when movies were just starting, they were usually very short snippets, and they would show things like, the, I think it was The White Cloaks of Dover was one of the early films that was just basically water splashing, and people would duck and think that they were being splashed by this water because you're seeing this thing, but then you're not feeling any ramifications of it, and it's it's different. If you've never exposed been exposed to this... It is a different experience. But anyway, we're going to stop there because I'm right at 10 minutes and I like to keep these videos short. We're going to come back and talk about some more people in just a minute.